So really using the network of people out there and get them excited about your collection. If they're planned field work in, in your country, make sure they kind of stop by at least for a day or two, or if you can keep them there for three days, even better, and make sure they help you identify in their areas of expertise. Another thing, and this is for um, a lot of, yeah, for a lot of collections, this is an important thing, but it's also a quite difficult thing. So specimen loans. So you might get, um, if you work in a, you know, from mid-sized to large museum, you might get a lot of requests to get specimens on loan. And you might go, well, I don't really know the people who are asking these loans. I'm a little suspicious. Um, I don't have the resources to actually ship the specimens unless the people requesting them actually pay for you know, FedExing them or doing whatever, then what about specimen damage? Fragile insects, do so I really want to ship out specimen loans or is there something that's just better not done? So I think a lot of, um, I'd say a lot of Central South American museums, North American museums, I talk about a European separately, um, they decided, well, there is actually a benefit of sending specimens out on loan because there are really high chances that what you're going to be getting back is much better curated and identified. Because typically people only ask for these loans if they work on a taxonomic revision or a monograph or something on that particular group. So those are the experts who are describing new species. So the benefits are you might actually end up with type specimens, for example, holotypes even, or definitely paratypes. And if nothing else, then a lot of well-identified curated specimens. Obviously loans are, um, they're very intense. You have to keep following up on them and make sure that people send the specimens back. That's one of the problems really that a lot of us have two big eyes and we take specimens with us when we visit a collection and then we don't really get the publication out on time. So sometimes loans are delayed for quite some time. But overall, this is a really good way of, together with the networking and bringing people in, sending specimen loans out is definitely a good thing. And then, um, just example, so it can be done on a fairly low cost too. For example, from um, the InBio collection in Costa Rica, which has received a loan of about 1,500 specimens of insects. So a fairly large collection, really. Um, and InBio doesn't have any money, so they couldn't pay for it. So we said, okay, we can pay for the shipping. And luckily they have great volunteers at InBio who can help with the actually handling of the loans. In this case, it was, you know, a volunteer who's worked in a collection for 25 years, so he knows everything really well. But there's ways of doing that on a relatively low cost. Okay, and then the other thing is really, you know, get your, get your collection out there. Make sure people know about what you're doing and know what you have, really. And we talked about whole drawer imaging projects. It can be done in a very simple, simple way. And we talk about some of the imaging and outputting images tools tomorrow as well. And this is really important, obviously. Okay, specimen organization. So this is what you know. I would say looks on pretty much ideally organized insect drawer that's really ready for digitization. In fact, all these drawers have obviously been digitized um, because this is part of a huge revision we've been working on for a while. So um, in many cases, what we're looking for, if there's lots of specimens we have for a particular species, we would make sure we only have one species in that drawer, so we don't really want to have too much um, mix up in there. Or if you accommodate multiple species in a drawer, you want to make sure the subdivisions are clear, you know, when a new species starts over another. So these unit trays obviously are, um, um, they make life much easier, but then even if you have the specimens pinned into the bottom of the, uh, um, the Schmidt boxes or the, the trays you're using, you can still organize them in a very logical way. Um, typically what we do in one of these unit trays, we either have specimens if they come in longer series, which means the specimens were collected at the same locality and the same collection event, so on and so forth. Um, we would put them in one unit tray or in certain other cases, like these bugs, they're all predators, usually we don't collect them in big series. So in this case, we actually have, those are specimens from different museums that we have on loan. So we ha would have different collections and different unit trays. <coughs> 
Another thing too that especially if you have series of specimens that makes it very fast and very efficient to do data entry is you have the males and females separated. So this is what you see here, the me males start off at a left corner of the unit tray and run all the way down to here and then this is where we store the females. <coughs> and you will see later on um, for the, in the actual data capture part of it, we don't enter each of these specimens if they're forming a series. We don't individually enter them, but we enter the entire batch. So we essentially read that first barcode label into the database, we jump right to the last one, and then all these you know, 20 whatever specimens get read into the database as separate records. So they keep their individuality, but um, it saves a lot of time. Okay, another thing that's really important is that specimens are oriented the same way, because again, that reduces the amount of time you need to handle them, pick them up, get them out, put the USIs on them, and read the label. So we're very strict about making sure that all the labels, you take the unit tray, you have to move it like that to actually read the label. So it's all very you know, strictly, strictly organized to, again, improve the workflows that we're using. And then in our case too, we stick USI specimen identifier labels on each of these, um, each of these specimens. Okay, so I'm not going to be saying too much about um, data capture really because this is, um, we're going to be doing this in, in practice and we've already heard a lot about it. So basic elements that comprise specimen occurrence data really, where, when, who, how, and what. And then obviously you can also input a lot of other information. The more information you input into your database while you capture specimen data, obviously the longer the whole process is going to take. So for a lot of the um, specimens we're capturing for the all three projects actually that I'm involved in, we really keep it to the core data pretty much and just have a little bit of additional information where it's really important. Okay, um, just a few more words on the database things that I might have forgotten before. Um, again, we're talking about the Arthropod Easy Capture database here that is used by a variety of different Arthropod projects including scorpions and bees and bugs and a few other um, groups of insects. So what makes the whole thing very efficient is too, there's a lot of drop-down uh, menus. You can actually tab through all the fields so you don't really have to use the keyboard that much for that. So that makes it very um, efficient. And then also, and we heard things like that before too, there's you know, cer certain error prevention methods in there such that you can't save a given record unless you've inputted at least the core information. So for example, you can never enter, uh, you can never save a record without specifying the depository for that particular specimen. Because we find it's pretty much useless to you know, not know where a specimen is really. The one thing, and then obviously a lot of the core things like the locality, for example, this is all stuff. There needs to be some information in these fields. And then there's a lot more flexibility pretty much on things that are down here and down there versus the ones up on top are really crucial. Okay, um, there's other ways also to, um, to keep the error rates down and that's really quite important. So obviously um, those are the fields where we enter the USI, the unique specimen identifier. We have what's called a beginning USI field and an ending USI field. And this is really meant for those cases where we have a whole series of specimens that we enter in one, in one, um, in one swoop. And this is where the first of the specimens would go in, and this is where the last of the specimens go in. And then you write, let's say, 25 records to the database. But what if you're making a typo, and instead of writing 25 specimens, <laughs> specimen records into the database, you read, you know, you write 10,000 in there because you had a zero that you were missing. I mean, those are relatively long and pretty complicated numbers. And that happened during the very early stages of the database, <laughs> and it was a bit of a mess. We um, we then decided to um, put some, you know, put some some warnings up there too. If you're writing more than a few um, a hundred or so records into the database, it will ask you and say like, "Is this really what you want to do?" Because you know we don't really quite trust you with that. That's the one thing. The other thing is we have <coughs> barcode scanners. Really, what would you know what people could use in a in a store, for example, to read barcodes 
ours are a little bit more sophisticated because we're actually dealing with matrix codes. So you need a little bit more specialized um, scanners to do that. But we're essentially forcing all our undergrad student databasers to use these scanners to they point them on the specimen and then they just they have to have the cursor sitting in this field and then they just enter that and um, the, the USI number gets read into it automatically. Okay, and I talked about the advantage of having specimens in series with, and when I say same data, I mean all locality collection, event information, all that the same, including the sex, because for a lot of the things we're doing, it's actually quite important to know what's a male, what's a female, really. Okay, um, and then the reality, obviously, and unfortunately, I couldn't really find an example of this really horribly handwritten insect label um, that collector at UC Riverside who did tremendous work but had a worst possible handwriting. But even with something like that, you see, you see the challenges because obviously you have to enter a country, you have to enter a subdivision for your country in it, and you know, what would you say? What's what's NC? So, sorry? North Carolina, there you go. <laughs> You're doing better than I probably did when I first moved to the U.S. because when I started data entry on a planetary biodiversity inventory project, I'm still being told I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I got California right, I knew that, you know, U.S. and things like that, but then when it comes to the secondary subdivisions, the counties, they're actually quite important in North America. People use them a lot. And I placed a number of localities into the wrong counties. So, you know, I had to go back and clean up things and other people did too. So, so it's a challenge really. Okay, um, I think, I wonder, so there are two ways we can do now. So I have little se sections on fluid preserved and on microscopic slide things now. Those are sections where I'm not gonna be talking there are videos where someone else who knows more about that actually went through the whole thing and showed them. Are we okay with watching them? They're like, you know, one is like five to six minutes and the other one might be similar to that. Okay, then let's keep going. Okay, so now to the fluid preserved specimen. So this is your ideal scenario. I would call it of a fluid preserved collection. Now, you know, standardized vials. They're sitting in these beautiful racks and um, their labels are pretty big. And also it seems like the labels are all more or less, you know, some are on, on, their, on their heads essentially, but a lot of the labels are turned such that you can pretty easily see them. So this is already a really well curated collection. What you would see much more typically is, you know, a random assortment of different jars and different vials and things like that. So there might be a lot of pre-curation you would have to do in order to actually bring it to that stage and that level. And then also you see actually one advantage of a lot of um, ethanol preserved collections is that more so than for your, your typical pin specimens, the labels are actually a little bit bigger. So that makes certain things a little bit easier. On the other hand, obviously they can be twisted and tilted and if you just image this, it is still quite difficult, obviously you can see, to really digitize that data record because of the um, uh, distortions you're seeing. Okay, so the challenge here are really the specimens are swimming in fluid, um, label may be obscured or might be um, twisted, twisted and tilted in some ways, there's some pre-curation that need to happen. And I think, and this is something that will come up tomorrow during the actual imaging thing again, is you really want to keep the purpose of the imaging of your spirit microscopic slides in mind. Because in many cases, what you might be interested in is really only the label data. So you don't really actually care about the specimen in there very much. And then you can go one way, that's much faster obviously. Or you might be interested in research quality images of the specimens. And then you might actually have to open up individual vials, get the specimens out, place them underneath an imaging system for high resolution imaging and then reconnect the data, the um, uh, locality information and such later on. So it's really two things um, you're doing there. Okay, and it really means that the purpose will also determine how the data will be captured. So if you really have the locality data, having a, a flatback bed scanner, a relatively simple and relatively inex uh, inexpensive model, can really be all you need and it can be fantastic. 
But if you're looking at um, imaging tiny little mites, for example, other tiny arthropods, obviously you might need a high resolution imaging system. So it's a real big difference in cost, obviously, that happens there. Okay, and I think I'm just going to be shutting up now and let other people talk about how they're dealing with their, um, their fluid preserved collection.